and now our special guest that will tell us a little bit or maybe something more we'll see about Filecoin so our main subject today main subject of this meeting so let's welcome Robert he's here with us as you see Falcon Foundation is today our main partner they help us organize all these things today so we need now to know what it's all about, this Falcon. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do we have a clicker? Amazing. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Beautiful. Perfect. Left. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think uh, we're good to go to get started. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, raise your hand if you're studying the law. Okay, most of us. Raise your hand if you're studying uh, engineering or computer science. Okay, one. Okay, good. Uh, all right, don't worry. This will be relevant to all the lawyers, I promise. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a history lesson, and then I'll talk a little bit about Filecoin. So if that works for all of you, I think uh, we're, we could get started. Is that okay with all of you? Okay, great. This is the Moore School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was here in the 1940s that the first computer was developed by researchers from Harvard, UPenn, the Navy, and the Army. This computer was called uh, the Electrical Numerical Integrator and Computer. It's the first Turing complete machine. And it was made up of these things called vacuum tubes, which are effectively light bulbs. And when you have electricity flowing through the light bulb, it represents a one. When you have no electricity, it represents a zero. That's your binary mathematics, and that's how you can do all of the types of calculations they were looking to do, such as, again, this is World War II, they were looking to calculate the trajectories of missiles. It wasn't until the late 1950s that Caltech professor Richard Feynman said, hey, wait a minute, we're currently in the space race, we're building everything big, we're trying to go to the moon, what if we built really, really small things? And he put out a proposal or a few proposals with a bunch of challenges to challenge engineers to make things at a very small scale. We're talking robots the size of that dot on that piece of paper. We're talking writing the entire Encyclopedia Britannica on the tip of a pin. And in fact, this challenge has led to some amazing innovation thanks to a specific material called silicon. For those of you uh, who, you know, you probably all are aware, silicon is a special material, it's a semiconductor, so you can manipulate it to both conduct or insulate from electricity. And of course, it is on this type of material that we could build devices that either allow the flow of electricity or don't allow the flow of electricity. These devices are called transistors, and they're effectively a voltage gate, and you could control whether or not electricity is flowing across the gate at any given time. And as you can imagine, just like our vacuum tubes, if there's electricity flowing across the gate, you have a one. If there's no electricity, you have a zero, and that gives you, again, your binary mathematics. These things are built incredibly small. We're down to the three to five nanometer range. We're pushing down to the three to one atom uh, size range for that voltage gate, which is really, really incredible. This chart is something called Moore's Law. So this is a proposal by an IBM engineer, last name Moore, different Moore than the Moore School of Electrical Engineering, uh, but basically showing that every some number of years, the amount of transistors you could fit on a two inch by two inch chip uh, will double until we reach some uh, extreme limit, uh, which at this point is looking like it'll be one atom or one electron, in which case we're getting to uh, com uh, quantum computing. This is a four inch diameter silicon wafer on which there's about a hundred uh, uh, chips that would operate your computer or your, or your phone. And on each chip, you have about 2 billion transistors. So uh, just, just for uh, an impression of scale, if you were to build a computer out of vacuum tubes, 
with the same computing power as the computing power you have in your pocket on your phone with one chip right now, you would need the entire Pentagon building in Washington, D.C. to take up the space with those vacuum tubes. And in fact, the ENIAC, uh, which, you know, is as fundamental as you get, uh, took up a huge room and was made up of 180,000 vacuum tubes. So it's really, really amazing how much progress has been made. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you in the back. Okay. So finally, we reached the 80s and 90s, and we want all of our devices to start talking to each other, so we introduced the internet. I'm going to come back to commenting on the internet, um, but for now, I just want to tell you a little bit about a specific group called the Cypherpunks. So the Cypherpunks were uh, the first case of internet activism, they were a listserv in the 1990s of engineers and privacy enthusiasts and academics who basically said, hey, if we're going to have this internet thing uh, where all these devices are going to talk to each other, then it's incredibly important that we have privacy technology that will allow people to communicate the information only that they want to communicate, uh, especially when it's sensitive, such as your banking information, your health information, your education information. And so they advocated for a lot of the uh, cryptographic research that was done by the U.S. government and other uh, institutions to be released to the public in an open source format. The reason I mention them is because uh, many of them were involved in the first uh, conversations with Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, on the Bitcoin talk forums and even influenced the design of Bitcoin through those discussions. One of the cypherpunks, Hal Finney, who uh, unfortunately passed away from ALS, actually received the first Bitcoin transaction ever from Satoshi Nakamoto themselves. So, okay. Yep. So then we fast forward. I skipped slide. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, sweet. So then we fast forward uh, another 10 years or so, and we're in 2008 and 2009, and we have the financial collapse. So this kind of perfect storm of uh, grievances with the banks that have destroyed the economy and all this very interesting uh, cryptography and uh, really internet money research that had been going on for uh, a couple of decades kind of came together to create the perfect circumstance for something like Bitcoin to be introduced. And in fact, this article from The Times, which is a British paper referencing the bailout of the banks, uh, is actually uh, referenced in the Genesis block of Bitcoin, which I will show you how that looks uh, later on. But this might show you some of the philosophical motivations behind having something like Bitcoin. Okay, so then 2008, 2009, enter Bitcoin, and Bitcoin introduces a number of innovations that I want to tell you about. The first, let's see if we have... Uh, uh, Okay, I'm not going to try to see if there's a laser on here, but uh, the first is with respect to privacy and how your accounts deal with a privacy model. So in banking, which is the privacy model at the top, when you have a digital bank account, what's happening is your account is your identity and your transactions are done by a trusted third party and the trusted third party is interacting with the counterparty the person who, let's say you want to send money to another person, the counterparty is their bank and their account. And all of this happens behind a wall where the public cannot see what's going on with these transactions. What Bitcoin introduces is a new privacy model where we don't know your identity on your Bitcoin account because it's represented by a random string of letters and numbers. It's just 25 or 30 letters and numbers random. But all of the transactions associated with that account, that is your pseudonymous account, um, is available to the public and you can see the full transaction history. This is enabled by something called asymmetric cryptography, where your public address, which is that random uh, string of letters and numbers, is kind of like your house address where you could receive mail or you could receive Bitcoin. And then if you want to send mail or send Bitcoin or you want to access your house, you need the key. Uh, in asymmetric cryptography, 
there is a second associated random string of letters and numbers uh, that is called your private key. And your private key is associated with your public key. And when you want to send Bitcoin, you sign for the Bitcoin you want to send by basically giving your, your, your private key. This is relevant for later. Don't, don't forget that information. Um, this also leads to some very interesting forensic uh, possibilities that we'll talk about in just a minute. So that's the first innovation thanks to Bitcoin. The second innovation is a very, very challenging problem in computing. It is called the Byzantine Generals problem. The Byzantine Generals problem is this. If you have multiple devices in different parts of the world, how do they agree on what a specific version of a file should be? How can we get multiple computers to agree as to uh, the same version of a file at any given time? And Bitcoin answers this question uh, with something called um, more or less proof of work. And we're going to talk about how the thousands of miners all over the world do proof of work uh, to come to consensus as to what the Bitcoin transaction history or the Bitcoin files should be at any given time. And they all agree, or a majority will agree as to what it looks like. So we start with a block. You might have heard of a block from the phrase blockchain, but a block is just a bit of memory that the miner, someone who is uh, doing this proof of work and adding transactions to the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, uh, just creates on their computer. So again, this is a block. It's just some memory on your computer. And uh, the Bitcoin miner is going to more or less collect a bunch of transactions that are proposed by Bitcoin users from Bitcoin uh, transaction purgatory that we call the mempool. The mempool is where all the transaction data kind of waits until a miner uh, picks it up. It's just this uh, space uh, in you know, random uh, space on the network. And then the miner will actually look at the uh, block height, which is the highest number of blocks they have uh, recognized, so to say, and they will add a plus one to the highest number of block that they can find. What does that mean? Well, effectively, they're saying, hey, we think the Bitcoin blockchain has this many blocks, that have been added to it. And we're going to add the next one in uh, the block chain. And they reference the previous block, uh, making it properly a chain, so to say. And then they do something that is a little bit interesting. They do this uh, nonce, which is a cryptographic puzzle. And there's nothing really interesting mathematically about it. There, it's, there's nothing smart about it. This nonce is effectively a random cryptographic puzzle and it's a random guess as to what this nonce actually is. So the computer is going to generate random numbers until it gets the correct number and has the right solution to this cryptographic puzzle. That requires the miner, by the way, to actually spend electricity. So that's where you get your proof of work. The nonce uh, requires the spending of electricity. The spending of electricity is that work. Now, You'll notice spending electricity actually costs money. Don't forget that. So more or less, this is how uh, Bitcoin has solved the problem of multiple computers needing to agree as to the current uh, file, uh, the current version of the file. A miner will add the transactions to the block. They will uh, label it as the next block in the blockchain. They will then solve the nonce to do a proof of work. And then they propose this block to the thousands of other miners on the blockchain. And if the other thousands of miners say, hey, this looks good, they will start building the next block in the blockchain. Now, what does it take for the next block in the blockchain for the miners to go for the next one? Well, they need to check two things. The first is uh, that the nonce is correct, that the proof of work actually happened. And the second is that the transaction history shows that no one has double spent any Bitcoin. And this is a very, very important uh, last and third kind of innovation that Bitcoin introduces, is this idea that there's no double spend. What is double spend? 
Well, in banking, uh, before we had Bitcoin, technically speaking, you could send the same hundred, let's say, U.S. dollars to two different people. And it would take days for the banks to realize that, hey, you only had $100 in your account, but you sent $200, $100 to each two different people. Uh, and this is effectively a form of inflation. It requires a trusted third party to correct it. Um, and more or less, it is a problem for uh, a financial system that we don't have a trusted third party in Bitcoin. We have competing miners competing to add your transactions to the blockchain. So the way this is solved is that transactions on Bitcoin are append only. You could only add transactions. Uh, you can never take them off. They can never be reversed. And the way they are checked to make sure they're not double spent is that it turns out when you receive Bitcoin, you're actually getting something of substance. And Satoshi Nakamoto references this or actually specifically defines what Bitcoin is in the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess as to what, um, how Satoshi Nakamoto defines what Bitcoin actually is? No, yes, maybe. Anyone brave? Yeah, in the back. Uh, no, that's not the definition, but uh, anyone else want to take a guess? Um, do you want me to just tell you? Okay. Satoshi Nakamoto defines Bitcoin properly, this is a quote from the white paper, as a chain of digital signatures. So what does that mean? When you receive Bitcoin, you're getting the entire history of all of the private keys that have signed for that Bitcoin and have owned that Bitcoin in the past. So the miners are actually checking those private keys to make sure they haven't been double spent. So that is the third innovation that Bitcoin introduces. And then finally, this is probably the most interesting chart in all of uh, finance in the past, uh, let's say, three decades. Um, this is the Bitcoin money supply. Now, you'll notice I told you Bitcoin miners are spending electricity in order to add the block to the blockchain. That's not free. That costs money. But when a block gets added to the blockchain, they actually get paid with newly minted Bitcoin that's never been in circulation before. We call that newly minted Bitcoin the miner's reward. And every 210,000 blocks that are added to the blockchain or every four years, that miner's reward cuts in half. Okay, I'm gonna, tr let's see if we have a laser. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna say we don't have a laser. No, we don't, okay, no problem. Except there's a laser right here. So there should be a laser. Ah, brilliant, okay, good. I can't reach that high, so this is, uh, okay. So you'll see these blue marks here are the Bitcoin miners reward. And you'll notice every 210,000 blocks, they cut in half. So we start at 50 Bitcoin. This is a miners reward on this side. We start at 50 Bitcoin. And then uh, after four years, it's, it's 25, then 12, then six and a half, then, sorry, 50, then 25, then 12 and a half then six and a quarter. And as of last week, we are currently at a Bitcoin miners reward of three and an eighth Bitcoin per block that's added to the blockchain. Now you'll notice two very interesting things. The block speed or the time at which it takes a block to be added to the blockchain has not changed. So the miners are spending the same amount of electricity to add or to earn half as much Bitcoin as they did before. I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to what that means in terms of how the Bitcoin miner operates their business and what it would mean for them in terms of the price they need to sell the Bitcoin at to stay in business. But the other interesting thing is this red line, which is the Bitcoin circulating supply. So this is all the Bitcoin in circulation. And you'll notice because this miner's reward, which is the newly minted Bitcoin put in circulation that's never been in circulation before, because the miner's reward has a half-life, the, uh, the, the supply of Bitcoin actually has this kind of inverse log scarcity. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in circulation uh, maximum over the lifetime of Bitcoin. Um, so that leads to some very 
uh, it's kind of a deflationary uh, asset. And this chart you would have seen in your Eco 101 class. Um, this is the average inflation rate as a function of central bank independence. So the more independent your central bank, the lower the inflation, but naturally uh, you will always have a positive inflation. Um, the reason for that is governments, the, there's a number of reasons why they uh, have inflationary money. Uh, other than keeping assets in an upward trajectory. Um, the other reason is that, in the most extreme cases, governments like to spend on debt and then inflate their money so that when they pay it back, it's actually worth a lot less. And the extreme cases where you have that is Venezuela and Zimbabwe. So I'll let you uh, look into that yourself. And by the way, mining has become so competitive that you now need specialized uh, equipment to do it. You cannot do it on your computer, unfortunately, anymore. Okay, so that's Bitcoin. Then in 2016, Vitalik Buterin came along and said, hey, this is really great that we're doing transactions on Bitcoin. Why don't we ex extend this uh, transaction system to all types of commerce that we might do, any commerce that we might sign a contract for? And so he introduces Ethereum which is a blockchain that also has a more or less a virtual machine built on top of it where you can write smart contracts. Any contract that you could write as a lawyer to enforce a business transaction, you can now write into code and the code will execute that business logic automatically. And I like to show this comparison because you could kind of see with this comparison uh, the difference in the philosophy behind Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin uh, is designed maybe for transactions and savings. You have a half-life on the miner's reward, so you have a scarce asset. Uh, you have a new block every 10 minutes. On Ethereum, you don't have that scarcity. Uh, there is a deflationary pressure, uh, but that's only with uh, gas fees and Ethereum that gets burned. It's not uh, written into the design of the money supply. Every block that's added gets uh, two ETH as a miner's reward, and that extends infinitely and you add a new block every 10 seconds or so uh which kind of suggests that you know we're going to need transactions to settle much quicker than they would on bitcoin because people are going to be building apps and doing all sorts of commerce on ethereum and i think the best uh, kind of analog assets bitcoin is kind of like gold in that it has scarcity uh and ethereum is kind of like oil where the Ether cryptocurrency is more or less fueling all of the commerce that's being done on the Ethereum blockchain. There's one more point of comparison I like to go through, and that's that account types are actually different on both Bitcoin and Ethereum. So he will hear us heard of an unspent transaction output. Okay, a few of us in the back. So Bitcoin and Ethereum work very different when it comes to settling transactions and actually sending money. Bitcoin uses a system called an unspent transaction output. How does this work? Let's say, as an example, you want to go buy a sandwich and the vendor is selling a sandwich for 14 US dollars, but you only have a 20 US dollar bill. What is practically happening when you go to buy that sandwich is you are giving over an account worth 20 US dollars to the vendor. The vendor is then breaking that into two accounts, one worth 14 US dollars, which they'll keep, the other works worth six US dollars, which is the change account, which they'll return to you. And then they're giving you the sandwich. That's exactly how Bitcoin works. When you send Bitcoin under the hood, you're actually probably sending more Bitcoin than you intend to, but you will get back a change account. Uh, and you could actually see this on the blockchain. And this actually helps people. Uh, and it, it leads to an interesting forensic situation where you can determine which transactions are the amount that's actually meant to be sent and which transactions are the change account. Uh, and how could you determine this? Well, you might assume that uh, people send kind of clean values. Let's say if you have an eight decimal number uh, and someone sends a transaction that's like 0.525 and then five trailing zeros. And then the other eight decimal transaction is just a random number uh, 
Well, the clean number, the one with the trailing zeros is probably the actual Bitcoin being sent. And uh, the random number is probably the change account because you don't know how much Bitcoin you're actually sending. It's whatever the largest UTXO is you have in your account. Ethereum works differently. Uh, Ethereum is a simple uh, account model. So you send a transaction just like you would on a Venmo or a Cash app uh, or any other type of payments app. And the state of the Ethereum state machine actually updates with that uh, transaction information. And you are effectively updating uh, the state of Ethereum when you send a transaction. Um, so every time a transaction happens, the state of Ethereum updates. Okay. And then finally, I'm not going to get into this because uh, at this point, people kind of are aware the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. Ethereum has switched to proof of stake. And that's all I'll say for now. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Amazing. What do smart contracts on Ethereum enable? Well, a whole bunch of interesting use cases. You might be very familiar with NFTs. This is CryptoKitties, the first NFT. What is an NFT? Well, uh, the smart contract code is ERC721, and it's a smart contract standard where you can print a bunch of assets in the same family, but each one of those assets is non-fungible. So they represent something unique and they can't be broken down. Um, this is as opposed to your ERC-20 uh, ICO, which, by the way, can we play a video here? Um, is that possible? Can I just try myself? Let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. No. Okay. Can we play this video? Is that possible? Um, let's see. Oh. No. Yeah, just a red uh, thing in the middle. Yeah. Oh, great. Brilliant. Okay. So that's as compared to uh, your ERC-20 uh, smart contract, which represents initial coin offerings. So uh, really between 2016 and 2018, this very interesting smart contract called an initial coin offering was very, very popular. And what happens on, a, on an ICO is you have a smart contract that has an address. If you have Ethereum, you send your Ether to that smart contract address. And then the smart contract sends back to your account a newly minted cryptocurrency that we call a token, also available for uh, transactions on Ethereum, but it sends that newly minted token that's just been printed by the smart contract to your Ethereum address. And in fact, you'll remember I told you on Bitcoin, because your address is public and we could see your full transaction history, we could actually trace that. Well, you could do the same thing on Ethereum. And you can do the same thing with Ethereum public addresses and also smart contract addresses. So this visualization is actually the fundraising done on all of the initial coin offering smart contracts from 2015 through 2018. Um, and we know this because you could parse through the data and actually see the amount of Ether that's been sent by third parties to the smart contract address. So this really cool piece of forensics and data science is something that's new to the world of finance, um, thanks to the open and anonymous nature of uh, the cryptocurrency accounts. Oh, I have clicked the wrong thing. Okay. Okay. All right, great. Figuring this out on the fly. Other really interesting forensics you could do is you could actually trace transaction patterns to determine if some transaction pattern will uh, let you know something about the type of, let's say, fraud that's going on. So this is an interesting case of an initial coin offering called Car Taxi. It's totally ridiculous. This is a company that goes uh, in Russia on the Trans-Siberian uh, Highway and picks up cars that have broken down and tows them off to a gas station. 
They claim that they have 40,000 customers and that they raised seven million dollars in an initial coin offering. Why, first of all, why they would need seven million dollars, let alone do an ICO, no one knows. But this is what they claim. Luckily, we know the smart contract. Why do we know the smart contract address? Because they tweeted it, and we could actually see the money that has flowed in and out of the smart contract address because we could see uh, this information on the blockchain. So let's hope this is the laser. Okay, great. Uh, this red dot here is the address for the ICO smart contract for Car Taxi. Why do we know it? It's because the Car Taxi company tweeted, hey, send money to this smart contract address. And these blue dots are all of the third party, um, all of the third party addresses that have sent Ether to the car taxi smart contract in return for the car taxi token. You'll see that this smart contract forwards that Ethereum to this red, this is a wallet address, an Ethereum wallet address. Now you'll remember, I told you that crypto addresses are uh, public but anonymous, so they're a random string of letters and numbers. How do we know that this is a car taxi address? Well, a little bit of uh, forensic assumption is that if they're tweeting, if car taxi is tweeting that this is their smart contract, where else would the smart contract forward the ether that's raised? Only to their own wallet address. So we know they control this wallet address. And then we have a second round of the smart contract, uh, which is represented by this red dot. And all these blue dots are the third party uh, sending Ethereum to the smart contract. And then you'll notice something interesting happening with the transactions in and out of the car taxi wallet. And that's that car taxi is not only receiving ether from that smart contract, they're also sending ether. So when you parse through the, the uh, transactions, maybe I got ahead of the punchline here, but turns out from the blue, the little blue dots, all of those third party investors, they only sent a total of 2 million ether 2 million US dollars worth of ether to that smart contract. The other $5 million was sent by car taxi to their own ICO. Why would you do that? Well, it might uh, suggest that this ICO is more popular than it really is, encouraging investors who are uh, maybe convinced by fear of missing out to invest in a ICO smart contract like this. And this, uh, by the way, this type of data science is done by a great startup out of New York called Elementus. Uh, they really do some amazing forensic work, not only on cases like this, but also on things like uh, ransomware attacks and uh, finding uh, Bitcoin that's paid by hospitals that have been taken hostage and uh, by the ransomware hackers. Okay, great. And then finally, I told you I would show you how Bitcoin actually has that article reference in the Genesis block. Well, it turns out this is a raw hex uh, print of the Bitcoin Genesis block. Raw hex is uh, you, uh, maybe for the one computer scientist in the room, uh, raw hex, you can convert your binary digits into raw hex. So let's say your binary digits are uh, 256. Uh, how do I, how do I, how do I translate this? Let's say your uh, binary digits are eight decimals long or eight, eight, uh, eight numbers long. Your raw hex can be two or four numbers long. So you could compress that information and print it out. But basically you are converting these letters and numbers uh, into other numbers. Anyway, it's beyond the point. You can actually write into uh, Bitcoin transactions some information and on the Genesis block you could see this Times article is referenced here. And writing data into transactions is actually really, really useful for labeling purposes. And people have started labeling the Bitcoin that they are sending to each other. Why would you want to label Bitcoin? Well, maybe you're a coin collector and uh, maybe you are a Bitcoin collector and maybe you want to own some Bitcoin that maybe Satoshi Nakamoto had, had once owned. Or you want to own some Bitcoin that was used in the 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas transaction that happened in 2010. Um, there's all sorts of reasons to label. 
These are called ordinals and inscriptions, and it's a new phenomenon on Bitcoin. It's a very, very interesting data science uh, thing. Okay, I'm skipping this. Great. All right. Finally, there's only 10 minutes left, I promise. You don't have to uh, continue to listen to me drone on. But I told you I'd come back to the internet, and this is where we start talking about Filecoin. So, who here is familiar with your IP address? Okay. Lawyers, I know for a fact that you use a computer and you know what your IP address is. So, uh, who has ever heard of an IP address? Okay, great. All right, perfect. Uh, yeah. So, what is your IP address? It turns out when you're sending information over the internet, you are sending data packets between IP addresses, and your IP address is actually a geographic location. This is uh, not the most useful way to organize information on the internet. Luckily, we have an example of another alternative that seems to work. And by the way, I've been corrected, but uh, we're going to say this anyway, even though it's kind of wrong and not the right uh, analogy. But anyway, if you go to your library, you have the Dewey Decimal System. And the Dewey Decimal System tells you something about the book you want to check out. The number represents the genre and a whole bunch of information about the book you're looking to check out. So effectively, your books in the library, every book has a unique Dewey Decimal number. And if you want to go find that book in a library, all you need is a Dewey Decimal number, look it up in the card stacks, and then go find it in the library. Turns out, not only interplanetary file system, which uh, many of you are maybe students of Martina, um, but also Filecoin use a system of organizing data very similar to the library's Dewey Decimal System. We call it content addressing, or CIDs. And effectively, every time a file is uploaded to either IPFS or Filecoin, it goes through a hashing algorithm that will produce a unique random number that represents that file. And that random number is the content address. Now, if you have the content address for a file, you only need to come to the network and say, hey, I want this file. Can I retrieve it from whoever on IPFS or Filecoin currently stores it? And if you upload a second copy of the same file, you're going to get the algorithm will produce the same exact, uh, the same exact uh, content address for that file. But if you make any change to that file, you're going to get a different content address. Turns out, this actually leads to a lot of very, very interesting, uh, again, forensic uh, features. And this group out of Stanford University called Starling Lab actually uses this feature in their work. So what does Starling Lab do? Turns out they go to war zones, uh, like in Bosnia or Ukraine. They take photographic evidence of war crimes, and then they upload that photographic evidence to Filecoin because once it's uploaded to Filecoin, those photos have a unique content identifier. And if anyone wants to tamper with that evidence, the content identifier will change. So when they create a dossier, and they submit that dossier to the International Criminal Court as they have actually last year, they can give the International Criminal Court not only all the evidence, but a guarantee that no one has tampered with that evidence. So this is a very interesting, um, helpful feature of this content addressing. And uh, by the way, their, um, their cameras also have cryptographic, another cryptographic tool that is evidence that they did take the photos, the photographic evidence, in the time they said they did at the location they said they did. So you might say, okay, Robert, that's great. You've told me that on both IPFS and Filecoin, uh, all of the files are uniquely labeled. And uh, that's great, but how are they organized? Well, the files are organized in the same way you would organize your files on a computer, uh, basically down into folders, but because we're doing computing, and I know this is maybe not relevant uh, totally to this audience, but we have in computer science uh, 
if you do a computer science class, you will spend uh, a lot of time. Let's say you take your sophomore year mathematics for computer science. It's a very miserable course. Don't recommend it if you don't have to. Uh, but you will spend a lot of time working on graphs. And in graphs, we have two elements. The first is a node, which is just a thing on the graph. So in this case, it's a folder or a file. And the second element is an edge. So the edge describes a relationship between two things in the graph. And you'll notice this has an arrow, which basically says, hey, well, I'll do this one as an example. This has an arrow, which describes, at least in this case, that this file is in this folder. So the folder points to things that are in it. And that makes uh, the graph directed. So that is the first uh, kind of description of this graph is directed. The other description of this graph is that it's acyclic. What do I mean by acyclic? Well, you'll notice if I traverse from picks to fish to fresh water, I can't go from fresh water to picks. There's no cycle. If I could do that, there would be a cycle and I could go around in a circle. Why would you want no cycles in a uh, graph that represents files uh, and folders? Well, Here's a counter example for you. Let's say you have a cyclic graph and you have folder A pointing to folder B and folder B pointing to folder A. What that's telling you is that folder A is in folder B and folder B is in folder A. And that makes absolutely no sense. So that's why it needs to be acyclic. And this is the graph, the data structure, that actually all files on both IPFS and Filecoin are represented like this. Uh, so every folder, and every file and every edge describing the relationship between the folders and files are actually represented by co unique content addresses and they're organized in this uh, directed acyclic graph. Now, why would you want a directed acyclic graph? It leads to a lot of very interesting features. First of all, it's distributability. Um, uh, okay, I've lost, oh, there it is, okay. Distributability, so anyone who has a directed acyclic graph can serve as the provider for it. It's recursive, meaning you can put smaller folders or smaller graphs into larger ones. It's verifiable, so if you retrieve data uh, from uh, this graph and you have the content address for that data, it probably means that you came to the network and said, hey, I have this content address, I want the file associated with it. Can someone give me that file? Once you have the file, you can actually rerun the algorithm to make sure you rerun the algorithm on that file to make sure it produces the same content address. And this actually guarantees or it gives you verifiability that you are receiving the right files. You're receiving the correct file that you asked for when you gave the content address because you can reproduce the content address for the file once you have it. And finally, deduplication. Uh, this is maybe mostly vanity, but because we're in a graph data structure and it's directed and acyclic, whoa, yeah. Uh, let's say you have a file that's in two folders. Well, the two folders can just point to the file one time instead of having it represented twice on the data structure, which makes it much uh, more efficient to retrieve that information. You don't have to traverse multiple times. And also this is a really nice visualization. Anyway. Now, you'll notice that throughout this whole time, by the way, we call this the uh, interplanetary linked data. So all files on IPFS and Filecoin are content addressed. And this data structure that organizes the content address is called interplanetary linked data. And you'll notice I told you that files on both IPFS and Filecoin are represented this way, or they uh, adhere to the interplanetary linked data standard. Why would I tell you both IPFS and Filecoin? Well, it turns out IPFS and Filecoin are two totally different networks with two totally different sets of participants. So, you know, uh, I judge a lot of hackathons and we have a lot of submissions that uh, you know, in their pitch, they say, yeah, we use Filecoin to store information. And then we look at their code and it turns out they're actually storing on interplanetary file system. These are two different networks. And I'm going to explain to you the difference and why we have both. Interplanetary file system 
is a group of community nodes that are offering storage as a service for free. So if you store files there, there's no guarantee that those files will exist a long time into the future because those community nodes can go offline at any time. Filecoin was the answer to that problem. And Filecoin creates a renter's market around this decentralized storage um, so that you pay to have your data stored on one of these storage providers. And that guarantees that that data exists long into the future, or it, it gives more of an assurance. I shouldn't say guarantee. It gives more of an assurance that your data will exist long into the future. So how does Filecoin work? Well, let's say you're someone who wants to store data on Filecoin. You're, we would call you a client. And a client would come to the network and say, hey, I have this much data. I want to store it for this length of time. This is how much Filecoin I'm willing to pay. And they will propose this information, which together we call a deal. They will propose this deal to Filecoin, uh, the Filecoin uh, mempool or transaction purgatory. And more or less, a, a storage provider, which is kind of like a Bitcoin miner, but they have a data center. So there's thousands of these data centers all over the world, again, competing with each other to take storage deals from clients. A storage provider will see this deal and say, hey, I like that price. I have room in my data center. I can accept this deal. And they signal that they will accept the deal by providing the first proof of stake that we call proof of replication. And this is a cryptographic evidence that they've made a copy of this data onto their, um, onto their data center. And then every day after that for 540 days, which is the length of a Filecoin deal, they provide a second pr proof of stake, which we call proof of space time. And proof of space time is more or less a cryptographic evidence that the data is still in the data center at the time and location or space, memory space, that the storage provider says it's in. Every day that the storage provider provides this proof of space time, the client pays a little more Filecoin and rent to keep their data there. So the client doesn't pay all the Filecoin up front, they pay over time. If the storage provider fails to provide the proof of space time, Filecoin will get slashed from their wallet and they will lose money. So this is designed to ensure that people have uh, their data uh, appropriately stored and guaranteed to be there over time since the storage providers have very strong incentive to make sure that they're good stewards of that data. There's currently uh, 6.7 exabytes of data capacity on Filecoin across all the miners, which is equivalent to 7.7 .7 million gigabytes. Uh, it turns out this is equivalent to 1% of all global cloud storage capacity. And of this capacity, uh, it turns out 1.7 exabytes of that room or 1.9 gigabytes of that room um, are actually being used by clients to store data. Uh, why might we have a lower usage rate than what's available? Well, turns out you could also do transactions on Filecoin in the same way you would do them on Ethereum or Bitcoin. And Filecoin miners or Filecoin storage providers, they're one and the same. Uh, they actually get Filecoin uh, miner rewards. So uh, it turns out people will set up data centers just to go after the Filecoin miners rewards and not necessarily to use the data centers. Uh, finally, we have this uh, chart of costs. And you'll see thanks to low retrieval fees, uh, Filecoin tends to be cheaper for storage uh, than some of your centralized cloud options. Okay. Finally, what else is going on in the world of Filecoin? Well, there is a service called Filecoin Plus, and uh, Filecoin Plus is a system of volunteer notaries that will check the data being added to Filecoin to make sure it's actually useful data. And uh, it turns out if a storage provider accepts a Filecoin Plus deal or a deal that's been checked by a notary, you actually get a 10x on the miners reward you would get for taking that storage deal. So uh, as you can imagine, 99% of all storage deals on Filecoin are now verified by Filecoin Plus. 
uh, because why wouldn't you, for the same cost, uh, 10x your miner's reward? Uh, we also have the Filecoin virtual machine. So just like the Ethereum virtual machine, you could do smart contracts on top of Filecoin. Now, why might you want that if there's other options like Ethereum? Well, it's because you'll have access to the data storage primitives available on Filecoin. This is one of my favorite examples um, of a use case that is unique to Filecoin using smart contracts. So you remember I told you storage deals are time limited. Every 540 days, the storage deal expires and a client needs to decide whether or not they want to renew a storage deal or go to a different storage provider. You could write a smart contract that handles this for you. What might the business logic look like? Well, step one, you would endow a smart contract with a whole bunch of Filecoin. So you send Filecoin to a smart contract address that you're writing. Step two is you have the smart contract invest that Filecoin someplace, uh, let's just say for this hypothetical, in a conservative investment that returns a reasonable 8% per year, as an example. Step three is you would track the storage deal that you might be interested in, that you might want to consider renewing. And then step four is, and this is what the business logic looks like, if you made more money last year on the investment than it costs to renew the deal next year, automatically renew the deal. If not, find a new storage provider. And that's what the smart contract logic could look like. You could also use smart contracts to uh, gatekeep who could access certain files. So you can guarantee that only certain Filecoin addresses have access to files. And you could imagine you can actually set up uh, pay to access uh, from certain uh, Filecoin addresses using file access control on Filecoin smart contracts. And there's all sorts of other use cases, some of which are censored. Uh, I, I won't get into that now, but you could do all sorts of things with Filecoin smart contracts. Now, if you are a builder at a hackathon, I understand we're in the middle of a hackathon, you might be using a, a Filecoin uh, for storage, and you might want to consider whether or not you need to add smart contracts on top of that uh, storage you want to do. Why is that, and what are the considerations you might want to make? Well, first of all, you should ask yourself whether you need business logic on top of the storage you're doing, in which case, yes, you would use smart contracts, if not, you could just directly store your data. Now, if you do need smart contracts, you also need to decide whether or not you need something called an aggregation service. And this will depend on how big the amount of data you want to store in Filecoin actually is. Why is that? Well, turns out Filecoin data storage, the fundamental unit is called a sector. And this is 32 gigabytes. So if you're storing less than 32 gigabytes, you need to aggregate it with other people's small data uh, into a 32 gigabyte sector so that the storage provider is interested in taking your storage deal. And the reason for that is that the uh, Filecoin storage providers want to make sure they're using all of their memory space. Okay, we're at the end here. Uh, what I just described to you is computation over the state of Filecoin. This is all dealing with uh, the metadata of the Filecoin uh, uh, data storage. Eventually, we'll have compute over data. So that means actually doing compute jobs with the data that's stored on Filecoin. What does that mean? Well, this is your AI training or your machine learning training. And we have a team working on that called Bacalao. They just raised around and they have really cool... Uh, apps that they've built like Water Lily, which lets you uh, do AI generated images based on images stored on Filecoin as an example. We also have a platform called Saturn, which makes retrieval of data from Filecoin very easy. This is a content delivery network and it will enable video uh, streaming over a decentralized network for the first time, which is really cool. And then finally, our last uh, interesting innovation to come out of Protocol Labs it's called Interplanetary Consensus. This is a blockchain scaling solution. So you can imagine, I told you earlier about how on Bitcoin, every 10 minutes a block is added. That block has a specific size. So you're limited as to how much transaction data you could write onto that block. Same with Ethereum, except the blocks are smaller, although they're more frequent every 10 seconds. 
One such scaling solution to solve this issue is called interplanetary consensus. So imagine you have your main, we'll call it the parent blockchain. In this case, this purple blockchain is Filecoin. <laughs> excuse me. Your, um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, with interplanetary consensus, you could deploy something called the subnet, which is simply a second blockchain. And what you're doing is you will lock the Filecoin on this uh, block for use on the second blockchain. And this uh, second blockchain exists in its own world, its own time scale. All the transactions happen there with that locked file coin on accounts here. And you might be running an app that you need uh, a higher transaction throughput for, or you might want some specific uh, unique consensus uh, rules that you might want to deploy on this second blockchain. Periodically, the data from this second blockchain will save to the parent blockchain in case you need to, uh, you know, revert back uh, in the event there's a catastrophic issue. And then finally, when you are done running this blockchain and all of the uh, apps have finished running, you will uh, close the accounts here and the accounts will settle back to the same accounts on the parent blockchain. Um, and of course, as subnets can have subnets themselves, you can have multiple subnets from the same parent blockchain. Um, but this is just as many Google slide uh, shapes I was willing to create. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I could talk a lot about uh, blockchain and the law, but maybe we'll do that over a drink outside. Uh, if you want to come to a hackathon, I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to me on Telegram. This is my QR code. You can reach out to me there. Um, but other than that, uh, thank you, first of all, Martina, for organizing this and the Youth Warsaw team. And thank you, everyone, for coming out. This is uh, unbelievable uh, showing on a holiday. Uh, there's 150 people in this room. I'm pretty sure there's another 200 people outside. So I hope we have enough, uh, uh, you know, beverages and uh, food for everyone. But uh, time will tell. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. I'll see you outside. <laughs>